I want to tell you the true story of a manly man. A manly, a manly man. Not the tennis guy, no. That guy was a jerk. We don't, we don't uphold Bobby Riggs as a, as a manly man. No, it was a manly man named Dave. Dave, was, uh, Dave wasn't quite like other guys. He was very hard to miss. He was tan. He was good looking. He definitely caught people's eyes. But there was far more to Dave than just, of course, his good looks. He was a man's man, right? He did all the things. He worked outside. He, uh, he knew the land. He lived like the back of his hand, of course, right? And, and he, he was a big camper. He'd camp out a lot, sometimes staying out for days in the wilderness. And sometimes, you know, you were out in the wilderness, you have to, you know, the wildlife would come into his camp. You have to fight off the wildlife and, and uh, do that like a man would, right? And as a matter of fact, he never backed down from a fight, this manly man. He gained a reputation for standing up against bullies he ended up joining the army, of course, because that's what you do, where his successes quickly, of course, got him promoted. Uh, and his leadership and his attitude made him, made all of his men super, super loyal to him because he was a man's man. And this man's man eventually had what amounted to his own unit. His soldiers were the best of the best. And truth be told, it seemed like everything he did had success. But to top it all off, he wasn't just a manly man who commanded many other manly men. This manly man was also an accomplished musician, right? Because people who have skill just seem to have all the skill, right? And in fact, he was so good that he got invited to play in front of world leaders. He wrote a bunch of songs that ended up going viral. And he even wrote a book that, was turned, that millions of people have read. And of course, so what happens when you have a manly man who leads manly men and who is very popular with other manly men is you go into politics. You went to politics, which makes sense because almost everybody loved Dave and he was elected. Uh, but there was, of course, as there always is, some political infighting, and it, w- meant it took a while for some things to work out before he actually got to take office. But Dave was patient, refusing to just take what was his and let the process play out, which was good because when it did play out, and the payoff was his leadership caused the community to prosper, and he remains one of the most popular leaders of his day. So Dave, or David, the son of Jesse and the king of Israel, he was probably one of the manliest men to ever manhood, this guy. You know, we always see, this is Bernini's statue of David. I, everyone likes to see Michelangelo, we just kind of, oh, whatever he's doing in that, I don't even know. <laughs> I love this statue of David because I think it just captures him as, as, you know, he's got the sling, he's about to take on Goliath. It's just a great, I love this picture. And he was one of the manliest men in the Bible, and he served as a model in many ways for us not just to be adult males, but men after God's own heart. So today we're going to talk about, as we go through our series Undefiled, we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to talk about manhood, what a manly man, what a man of God looks like. Next week we're going to talk about womanhood, okay? So today, guys, talking to you, pay attention. Ladies, also want you to pay attention because what's going to happen here is, uh, I'm trying to paint a picture, we'll talk a little bit more about it in a second, but there's something for everybody here. And next week there will be something for everybody as well. So let me ask you this question, where do we get our concepts of manhood, right? Who are our examples? Who are our role models? Well, first of all, I believe that all men and women get their concepts uh, from their fathers, right? From their fathers. Uh, He is the most immediate example of a man in their life, which is interesting because some of you immediately go to your dad and you think, yeah, my dad was awesome. And others of you went to your dad and say, my dad was a jerk. Guess what? In both instances, your dad is a leading example of a man in your life. Which is why generations that grow up without fathers often produce boys who don't know how to act like a man and, or women who don't know how to find a real man to have a relationship with. Now, at the same time, families with an engaged intentional father uh, they, with a, or a father figure, they show greater emotional maturity, greater resilience, and healthier long-term growth. So the why of this discussion is to raise the standard of manhood for men and women, which leads to healthier relationships, stronger families. There's a recent statistic floating around that states that if the man of the house becomes a Christian, if the man of the house is a Christian, there's a 93% likelihood that the rest of the family will too. That's some serious influence, guys. We carry a lot of weight. So growing up, my brother and I were exposed to all sorts of ideals and images. Most of my early role models were G.I. Joe, uh, big fan of Duke. Flint, you know, and the rest. Snake Eyes, of course. Who was cooler than Snake? I never really got into gung ho. I mean, the dude walked around and just to, not to knock the Marines, but any guy walking around with a vest with a Marine tattoo, I just, I couldn't hold up to that standard. I just, I just couldn't do it. Anyway, 
But they were my role models were the G.I. Joes. They were the comic books that I read. They were the, the movies we watched. And there was an optimism. There was a strength in these characters. But in the same turn, as a guy, I found these, a lot of these superheroes were examples I couldn't live up to, right? That you could never be as strong as Thor or, or some of these other characters. And, and, and comics and movies and video games we talk about are being derided a lot of times for the over-sexualization of women. And we, that's, that's true, but it can be just as guilty of creating this false ideals for men as well, guys and role models that we, we just don't feel like we can live up to. Another challenge for men that we often face is that we have determined that many characteristics and pursuits for men are, are, are less than masculine, right? Um, you know, we talked about this last week, that there are roles or jobs uh, that, that, that men do that some people say are still a job for women, which is a whole other side discussion, but I still run into people who can't fathom that a man can be a nurse or they deride a man who has a Pinterest board, right, who tracks this kind of stuff. So here's an interesting, people find it, people are amused when they find out that it's often me who takes our girls clothing shopping. I'm the one that takes our daughters to, to the store. My daughter was getting ready for her senior pictures. Who took her clothing shopping? This guy. Or I had a friend who I helped pick her prom dress out a couple years ago. It would be me. <laughs> and so, you know, and, and, and <clears throat> what happens is that people... Uh, stere- there's, look, there's endless stereotypes for being a man or what it makes you less than a man. And what happens is people start, what's worse is when people start to believe that the, the lies of the stereotypes and they adopt a lifestyle that they think will help better define them by their interests. And it can go both ways. Maybe it's the overtly masculine bro, right, who pursues sex and relationships like it's an episode of Jersey Shore or something, Right. Or there's a young man who comes to believe that his interest in music and art and culture means that he's homosexual. And I use these examples specifically because I've seen both examples. And I've seen them play out. And like I said last week, this is coming from a guy who was a cheerleader in high school who was involved in choir, involved in drama, and did all of these things. And I'm sure you can imagine the frequent jabs at my masculinity and my sexuality in high school. To be fair, I was wearing purple pants. It didn't help my case, but... (laughs) Turned out okay. Purple and, gold. Unse- purple and gold. To top that off, to top it off, the Bible has these manly, manly characters that seem almost supernatural, right? There's Samson, of course, stronger than anybody ever. Uh, there's another guy who kills 300 enemies in a battle with, with just his spear by himself. And another guy is out, tracks down a lion, jumps into a steep snow filled pit, and wrestles a lion. Come on, man. I mean, how do, we, how do we hold ourselves up to these, these standards? Well, none of these accomplishments ever, however, capture the essence of, of manhood because all of them really are, are arbitrary. They don't contribute to the character. They don't contribute to the innate nature of what makes a man a man. In fact, uh, speaking on manhood, a very manly man who was the president, Theodore Roosevelt, said this. He said, I want to see you game, boys. I want to see you brave and manly. And I also want to see you gentle and tender. See, it's not an either-or proposition. It's, it's both. Manhood is expressed in many ways, and, it, and, it, and honestly, it should be. And I think about that. I think we talk about, you know, if you're going to be a man, you've got to have a, a beautiful beard, and you've got to wear flannel all the time, or be able to wield an axe, or change a tire, or all these things, fill in the blanks, right, uh, of what we think the stereotype of, or you're into cars. I heard someone say last week, I don't like the stereotype that every guy is into cars. I don't. I'm not into it. And that's fine. Some people can, can barely check the oil. Some guys can barely check the oil in their car. Does it make them less of a man? No. You should just, you should just know that so your car doesn't blow up, but that's another. <laughs> it's just, anyway, I really think, though, if we're going to get a biblical idea of what a real man looks like, I think we can go no further than David. Again, a man the Bible records after God's own heart. Now, we're, we're talking about this day because as we go through this, I'm going to be speaking a little bit to the, to, to the men, but I want the ladies to listen too, and here's why. Because for the, for the men, guys, I want us to understand, we're called to be men of God. We're called to, to not just grow up into adults, but to be men, and that needs to mean something. And for ladies, I don't want you to, to settle. I never want you to settle. I don't want you to settle because there's a lot of adult males out there who don't deserve your time just because they're genetically and biologically an adult male. You need to hold out for a man. Yeah! You're like, oh, it's brutal. Yes, it is brutal. 
Because I see it. And I don't want to, I don't, I want to see a generation of men, not just adults. Totally different. We talk about David here real quick. The Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. But now David, look, he wasn't perfect by any stretch of the imagination. And we, if you know his story later in life, he made some decisions that compromised his integrity, damaged his authority. And many of his early victories on the battlefield stand in stark contrast to his late in life failures as a father and as a spiritual leader. So in a lot of ways, his life, if we were to just dive into his life, serves as both an example, but also a cautionary tale. Because manhood is not something that you do once and then ride it out. It's something that we strive for and try to grow in every day of our lives. David was indeed a man after God's own heart. He was a poet, he was a musician, he was a warrior, he was a leader, a king, he was a serving son, he was a passionate citizen, he was a faithful soldier, he was a devoted friend, and most importantly, he was a lover and follower of God. And I believe that David wrote for us, and if you've got your Bibles, go to Psalm 101. And I believe in that psalm we find a wonderful definition of what it means to be a man of God. And David here in this psalm is declaring what kind of king, what kind of leader he was going to be. And I think for all men it's going to should serve and can serve as a, a resolution. I'm going to call it a man ifesto, if you will. You can take that, yes, you're welcome. Of what kind of people we ought to be. All right. You can shake your heads all you want, but you're going to remember that. So... As, you, as we look at the psalm in just a second, you're going to recognize it's also a very personal psalm. Almost every line begins with the word I. I, I will. You're going to see that. And David is saying this about himself, that it's his declaration. And, and th- these aren't some abstract ideas about what others should do or just like, oh, this would be cool if it looked like this. But what he himself is going to do, he is owning this. And the man of God doesn't say, first off, I should, but I will. All right? The man of God does not say, I should. The man of God says, I will will. It's, you know, pastor talked today about looking at yourself in the mirror and saying, oh, I see something that needs to change, and then walking away and doing nothing about it. Guess what? That's kind of useless. So a man of God, you can say all the things you should do, but the man of God really should say, I will. Because if men don't determine what kind of person they, we, are going to be, we'll easily be swayed into becoming what someone else wants us to be. And so men in this room, when we want to look at this psalm as a measuring stick, is this true of me. And ladies in the room, I want you to look at this and say, this is what I'm looking for. This is a man worth waiting for. And we could spend lots of time defining what uh, things a true man does. And I bet if we just made that a question, you guys would all, well, a man's going to do this and a man's going to do this and a man's going to do this. But remember, it's his actions come out of who he is. And who he is, a real man, is defined by his relationship with God and proven by his relationship with others. So we're going to look at this psalm, Psalm 101, and see how David defines what a man of God looks like. So I'm reading from the New Living Translation, this psalm. It's very similar in in pretty much any version, but just as I go along, this is the translation. The first thing we see is a manly devotion to God, a manly devotion to God. And he sings, says in verse 1, I will sing of your love and justice, Lord. I will praise you with songs. See, expressing emotion isn't always associated with manliness, right? We're supposed to be stoic. We're supposed to keep those tears in, man. Someone's got to be the strong one in the room. It's going to be me, okay? <laughs> Whatever we do. We, men, we imagine men being emotionally strong and stoic, rarely seen crying. And for whatever reason, we've created this idea that being emotional, being moved to tears, or even being romantic is less than manly. But David declares and demonstrates that's not the case. I mean, David is known for what? For his passion, Right? He, he wore his heart in his sleeve. He, he talked about his disdain for Goliath. He's very clear uh, for that. Or his passion for God's word in Psalm 119. Or, or simply dancing before the Lord, regardless of what others thought. Even when his wife was like, bro, dude, relax. He's like, no, I'm not going to stop. David wasn't aware to wear his heart in his sleeve, and it's no more evident in the many psalms that he wrote. Psalms that I know many of you have found your emotions being described. And then we see a man who's passionate about God, who wrestles with his own sin, who loves what God loves, who hates what God hates. And men, we need to be lovers of God, not just silently or internally, publicly and verbally. Our love for God should not be a secret. We have nothing to be ashamed of. And the man of God makes God his priority and honors him with his life and his lips. So a man of God, there's a manly devotion to God. And then there's a manly dependence on God, of course, 
He says in verse 2, I will be careful to live a blameless life. And then asks this question, when will you come to help me? I think it's a noble thing that a man should desire to live a blameless and upright life. And as a leader, his decisions and his actions are going to set the tones for other people that come along. And David wrote in Psalm 119, he says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. But let's be very honest. Living a blameless life is difficult, if not you know, darn near impossible. So the man of God is also dependent on God. And I appreciate David's honest inquiry here. He says, I need help to live this life. God, when are you going to help me do it? You know, knowing when to ask for help, it's pretty key, right? Guys, we're, we're stubborn like that, aren't we? We'd rather just, you know, rather than ask for help, we just push harder. And it requires humility, a sense of your own limitations. And, and I get it. We're often teased for not asking for directions. I'll find it eventually, okay? Uh, or maybe we don't bother with assembly instructions, okay? I can put a bookshelf together. How hard can it be? All I have is an Allen wrench. All I need is an Allen wrench. But guys, there's no shame. There's no shame in being a man who acknowledges that he needs help. Remember the Bible said it's not good for man to be alone? And the Bible tells us this, that if we humble ourselves before the Lord, he will exalt us. And so the godly man knows that that the only way he can live the life God expects of him is in the strength that only God can give him. Feeling overwhelmed, guys? Feeling like you're falling short? Feeling like you're struggling? Ask for God's help. No shame in that. No shame in that. Uh, I am a parent. It's hard sometimes. <laughs> All I can do is ask for God's help. been married a long time. Relationships can be tough. All I can do is ask for God's help. Sometimes things happen out of my control. Do I just suck it up, man up, and make it happen, or do I go to God for help? One of those usually makes the problem worse. One usually makes it better. So what does this dependent life look like? Well, let's talk about his manly declarations to God. Here we go. Number one, the man of God lives with principles. The man of God lives with principles. He says, I will lead a life of integrity in my own home. It's been said that character is who you are when no one else is watching, and integrity begins in your home. Charles Spurgeon wrote this, Do you sing in the choir and sin in the chamber? Are you a saint abroad and a devil at home? For shame, for what we are at home, that we are indeed. And the man of God cares not just about, like I said, about being an adult, but about being a man, taking responsibility and ownership of their life living like nobody else, both publicly and privately. Secondly, the man of God pursues a pure mind. He says in verse 3, I will refuse to look at anything vile and vulgar. Boy, there's a lot that could, fill, that could fall into that category, isn't there? It's one of the hardest ones. The daily assault on our senses in all forms of media and guys who are visual creatures are vulnerable. It's not an accident the way they advertise things. Images seen even for a moment are often seared in our memories, often to our uh, detriment, and so we have to commit to turning away from those things, from the movies we watch to the things we read to the websites we visit. We need to choose to turn our eyes away. This is a verse that often sits with me and reminds me and, and challenges me, and I just have to go back to this declaration to say I'm going to refuse. That's a choice to look at anything vile and vulgar. The man of God, we'll touch base on that in a few weeks more, but the man of God, number three, passes on bad business. He says this, I hate all who deal crookedly. I will have nothing to do with them. So tax season's upon us, right? Everyone knows that. Woo! Yeah, it's nice to get something back, and the temptation to maybe make a few adjustments on the tax form every once in a while, get a little more in your pocket, very high, Everyone does it, right? Yeah. Or maybe you've, you've ever sold a car to a private seller who wants you to adjust the price so you can uh, avoid the higher taxes or registration fee. So let me get this straight. You sold a 2018 Ford Ranger for $1.50? Okay. <laughs> yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, that sounds right. So the opportunities to compromise are everywhere, and even when it looks like everyone else is doing it. But think about, the, but think about this, not just in terms of money, but about... Uh, the avenue of relationships or, or, or work promotions or work relationships, even amongst friends who may try to pull you into their schemes, right? 
I've often said that you can have anything this world has to offer if you're willing to make the moral sacrifices to achieve it. Or in Proverbs 20, 28, he says this, the trustworthy person will get a, a rich reward, but a person who wants quick riches will get into trouble. So the man of God passes on bad business, and then the man of God chooses the right path. He says in verse 4, I will reject perverse ideas and stay away from every evil. There's a time when a man of God is known more for what he doesn't do than what he does do. It's okay to be known as the guy who doesn't watch certain movies or go do certain activities or who chooses to miss out on something because it's simply a bad idea and no good will come of it. It's mainly to walk away from conversations that are going nowhere good or even to be the dissenting voice if our desire is to honor God and live in the light. Because as men of God, we are supposed to look different, live differently, love unlike anything the world offers. And sometimes that means staying away from what is bad so that we can embrace what is good. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he writes, Therefore go out from their midst, be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing, and then I will welcome you. As Christians and as Christian men, we need to demonstrate that there is a better way, that we don't do things the, the way the world does them. And men, we need to be the leaders in this to show them and show everyone that we do things the right way or no way. We need to choose the right path. And what does the Bible say about the narrow path versus the wide path? Everyone's on the wide path. We choose the narrow path. So the man of God, what we, do? We, 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 we choose the right path. It also means the man of God protects the reputation of others. I like this one. Verse 5, he says, I will not tolerate people who slander their neighbors. I will not endure conceit and pride. You know, among the challenges of social media, among many, and one of the negative effects of it is this unaccountable speech, right? Because people will say anything about anybody and whatever they want because they'll likely never have to look this person in the eye. Ever watch uh, mean tweets, right? Ever see that? Celebrities read mean tweets about themselves and things like that. Look, we bear the responsibility to kill the weeds of gossip and slander before they take root. To not just avoid ever bearing false witness about our neighbor, but also defending and standing up for their integrity. To be the place where rumors stop, where rumors die because we kill them. Or to say, you know, I, I, I think you're wrong. I think you're wrong. To be vocal in that way. Not only that, we need to stand against those who slander their neighbors, and we have to have zero tolerance for it, because slander is what? It's often a, another person, uh, their pride resulting in a person's heart. They, they, they talk trash about people as if what? Dimming another person's light somehow makes theirs shine a little brighter. And people do that sometimes when they're defensive. People are defensive, you know, or they're in a situation where something bad happens, and they know it's on them, but they don't want to deal with the responsibility, so they point at somebody else. They start talking trash about somebody else. Well, you know what they did? Whoa, that guy, not as bad as that guy. Well, you start doing that, yeah, you're actually worse. So, you know, it's a funny thing, though. Keep, keep this in mind. When you begin to reject those who seek to spread rumors and slanders, well, two things happen. First, they'll stop saying those things to you, right? They're like, well, we're not, he doesn't want to hear it. We're not going to talk to that guy. But second, they might start saying those things about you. And you become the target. So it's vital, men, that we not only defend the reputation of righteous people, but we live our lives with such integrity that if someone attacks our reputation, no one will believe them. Jesus said this, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. That's a warning for everybody. So the man of God, we've, we've talked about a lot of the man of God. He protects the reputation of others. And the man of God partners with godly people. I will search, he says, for faithful people to be my companions. Only those who are above reproach will be allowed to serve me. So who we surround ourselves with is, is important. Our friend circle is so important. We may have friends, but the character of those we allow into that inner circle is vital. And they, they should share the same heart, the same faith that you do. And and look, there's two ways to find faithful people. You can look for them, you can be patient, and you can come to places where faithful people gather, hopefully places like church. Or we can create them. 
So get this, you find them by going to where they hang out, or we create them by making an investment in other people. Because it's important that we are part of the multiplication of good people. Guys, it is our job to raise up other godly men. And that starts, it starts well before you're a father. It starts in the relationships you have, pouring into people, building one another up as iron sharpens iron, sharpening one another, making each other stronger. Paul told Timothy, you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, that what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So the man of God surrounds himself with godly men, with godly mentors, and then mentors others and holds himself and others accountable. And that's discipleship, guys. That's discipleship in the church, making and multiplying other disciples of Jesus. So we partner with godly people, but then the other side of that coin is the man of God parts with bad company. So he says, I will not allow deceivers to serve in my house, and liars will not stay in my presence. So on the other side of the statement of this is who he will not be friends with. And that choice is often as important as how we do surround ourselves with. A conscious, because sometimes, what do we do? We have our really close friends, but we have other people in our orbit. We just kind of let them hang around. They're just there, right? But are they really healthy influences? 1 Corinthians 15, 13 says, Don't be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. See, because David has committed to live with integrity, he is fully aware that the people he chooses to surround himself bear a large part in his personal development. And we are all the result of people we surround ourselves with, which is why we choose wisely. And if you are the only one in your group of friends that chooses to live with integrity, while it's noble to think that you can lead them by example, the likelier scenario is this. You will be lonely and struggle to maintain your own integrity. David reminds us in Psalm 1, Blessed is the man who, what, who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. So here it is. If there are some relationships, you may have to end if you want to become a real man. And ladies, pay attention to the, to the men that the, that the men in your life surround themselves with. And lastly, verse 6, verse 8, the man of God is focused on his purpose. He's focused on his purpose. He says, my daily task will be to ferret out the wicked and free the city of the Lord from their grip. So what is his mission? What is the mission of the man of God? I want to say it's this. It's the Great Commission. Because the only true way to drive out darkness is what? With light. And the man of God is committed to shining the light of Christ in dark corners, exposing the works of darkness and leading people towards Christ. And if there's any doubt that we're talking about being a man of God or ladies that you should seek a Christian man or that men, your primary goal in life is to honor God. This is it right here. Paul reminds us, though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but has divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. And we need to do that more and more and more, guys, to, to shine the light of Jesus Christ and the truth of the word of God into a world that it keeps trying to snuff out that light and keeps trying to scurry into darkness. And so just as it's the duty and responsibility of the king to protect his kingdom from the dangers of those who would try and sneak in and harm his city, a godly man takes up the spiritual battles, knowing that the only victory comes through Christ. Well, so what? Well, Here's one thought. If there's one thing I would add, my man, manly friends, is this. Living like a man requires boldness to step up into the role and humility to step back and let God work in you and to fill in what is lacking. So those seem to be contradictory. No, because for some of you, you need to man up and step into this role and say, I will be a man of God. Not I should be a man of God. I will be a man of God, but I can't do it without God's help. So the boldness to say, this is what I will be, and the humility to say, and I will do it in God's strength. Because it's a lot, guys. It's a lot. But it's doable. The man of God is something we should, that all men should aspire to be and all women should pray for. Ladies, we need your prayers. Okay? Please. And the man who is devoted to God, depends on God, and lives for God, will prosper truly in all he does. 
He will lead his family right, his business right, and the world he influences. And again, my challenge for all of you, my godly brothers, is not just to become an adult, but to become a man after God's own heart. Amen? All right. Father, thank you for this time and the word. Thank you for giving us the example.